think the passage from the Torah says, Rebbe Lazar ben Azariah says, I was like, I was 70 years old, and I never merited to say the Exodus at night, to say the Yitzhak Mitzrayim at the night, until Ben Zoma made a drasha. Ben jo do you have the place, Ezra? Do you, you got the place now? Because you were asking me the place. I don't, every book is different. So it, if you give it to me, I'll actually give it to you. So until Ben Zoma came along and made a drasha. What was the what was the drasha of Ben Zoma? The drasha of Ben Zoma was the hey. The drasha of Ben Zoma was the following. Here. Here. Do you need the place? You got it, guy. You got it. Until Ben Zoma, let me see. I can't have very bad eyes. Right. Until Ben Zoma came along and made a drasha. It says that you should remember the day of the exodus from Egypt, all the days of your life. All the days is, is an extra word. So we say, kol yamechayecha is the, uh, yamechayecha is the days. Kol yamechayecha is the nights. Yesterday we discussed the, the symbolism of remembering the exodus at night. But now I want to say a word about Ben Zoma. Rashi says, why did Ben Zoma... Why was it called Ben Zoma? It was called Ben Zoma because since he lived a very short life, he never merited to be called a rabbi. So therefore they called him after his father's name. By the way, it's so ironic that the one who lived a very short life is giving the drasha about all the days of your life. He had a very short life. How do we know he had a very short life? This is a story you can tell at your Haggadah, at your Seder. He had a very short life, how do we know? Because the Gemara Chagiga tells us that four entered into the Pardes. Who were the four who entered into the Pardes? Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, Rabbi Akiva, and Elisha Ben Avua. Elisha Ben Avua became a heretic. He became known as Achar. Rabbi Akiva went in the hole and he came out whole. And then Ben Azai looked at the divine presence and he died. And and Ben Zoma looked at the divine presence and he became insane. But the Yerushalmi says the opposite. Yerushalmi version is that Ben Zoma looked at it and died. So and died. Yeah, when they entered into the orchard. So this was Ben Zoma. So there's two versions of it. In the Babylonian version, he went insane. And in the uh and in the Jerusalem Talmud version, he died. But it's so, like, you have to read that story with the story. These rabbis are sitting together. And Barbanel explains that even though Ben Zoma was so young, Rabbi Lezer ben Azari said he was so much more youthful than me, nevertheless, he merited to teach me this law. So we see from here that no matter how young you are, you can teach the elders the law. That's what Rabbi Lezer ben Azari was saying. So that there were, why, another reason why it's called Ben Zoma is because there were four rabbis, four scholars whose first name was Shimon. Shimon Ben Azai, Shimon Ben Nana, Shimon Ateimani, the Yemenite, like our own, and Shimon Ben Zoma. And so therefore they called them by their last names. The Talmud in Sota 49a says, when Ben Zoma died, all the Darshanim died with him. Meaning to say there was nobody else to give a big drasha. What's a drasha? A drasha is a teaching. Now, all the teachings came from Ben. He was the best of the teachers. Uh, irony is that also on that same page in the Talmud, it says when Rabbi Akiva died, I forgot. Ooh. I think Rabbi Akiva, when Rabbi Akiva died, humility died. And then I forgot who. And the Gemara says, don't say humility died because I'm still here. That's the classic case, That he, the classic question. How could he say he's so humble? It says, don't say humility died. I'm still here. That's the last page in Gemara and Sota. If you look it up, Rabbi Yosef, you can give us the exact citation from Sota 49b. Yes, um, J. Uh, Jerry, yes. Yeah, uh, Rabbi, um, uh, Ben Zoma uh, apparently uh, likes the idea of night and he uh, used the kol uh, yumei uh, chayecha. Um, but uh, prior to his uh, pointing out that the Seder could take place at night, 
did the Jews uh, start the Seder uh, at lunchtime during the day? Oh, that's a good question. I think they were doing it in, I, no, they were doing the carbon Pesach and that, but you're right, it's a very good question. What were they doing before Benzoma? Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah. I don't know the answer. It's a good question. It's kind of like the question, how did they wear tefillin before they came to Deuteronomy? What do they do to about wearing tefillin before Deuteronomy? Because they have the passages of the Torah in Deuteronomy. And so it's a good question. I don't know the answer. I don't know. I don't know. You're asking a very nice question. Okay. So now let's go on. The um, What's the position of the sages? The sages say, Yemecha is this world, kol, all the days of your life is to include the days of the Messiah. Why does it have to say the days of the Messiah? So the Barbanel explains that they thought, so basically to answer your question, Jerry, clearly the sages understood already that you have to do it at night because they're, say, they're saying that, that, oh, maybe they didn't. I don't know, it's not clear, you're right. So the Barbanel says that the sages thought we shouldn't expound like Rebbe Lezer ben Azariah because it's so obvious. So here, Barbanel says, to answer your question, when it says, you may, all the days of your life, it clearly includes also nighttime. So, of course, so the rabbis felt, of course, you have to do it. So that answers your question. Of course, they were teaching it. Ben Zoma felt the need to make a specific drasha. Uh, the... Okay. The Shla explains that the sages thought Yemecha includes all the days of this world, the days and the nights. And so therefore, this world is just called the days of your life because the world to come, uh, because this world is a fixed world, where because it says the days are 70. So why do we have to add on this idea of the Mashiach? So Rabbi Akiva Eger explains, why don't they just say, Ko Yemecha Oh, so the, the the phrase here is unusual. It says, to bring along the Messiah. Why didn't you just say the days of the Mashiach? Like, uh, like Rebbe Lazar and Azari said, what's the extra word to bring? And so he explains, so he explains that it's to emphasize that in the time of the Mashiach, the exodus from Egypt will not be as great a story because we'll have a better redemptive story. The story of the complete release from, from, from the subjugation under other nations. So meaning to say it'll be replaced by a better story, but you still have to talk about the original story. Now, let me just say in passing a very good question that I once was asked by the chief rabbi of Venezuela. It's a classic question. And and he and he asked the question. Um, he said, "In the time of the second temple, did they?" Ha and the Gemara discusses this. Did they still have to observe Tisha B'Av during the time of the second temple? Mm -hmm. And he gave the answer of Rabbi Salavechik. And this is the chief rabbi of Venezuela said this while his country was facing tremendous anti-Semitism and basically being gutted. He said, "You know why you have to do it." And the second temple, they had the base of Mikdash. So why did they have to talk about the first base of Mikdash and mourn it so that it doesn't happen again? Okay. It does, so it doesn't happen again. You have to remember what happened so that it doesn't happen again. Now, that's a classic. You follow that? You understand what he was saying to me? He was saying to me, it's happening again. So he was saying the reason why you had to observe Tisha B'Av during the time of the destruction of the second temple was so that you remember what happened so that it doesn't happen again. You follow that then? The, the Tisha B'Av commemorates the destruction of the temples. So now that the destruction of the first temple, but now that the second temple is built and standing and we're observing the second temple, so do we have to still commemorate the Tisha B'Av. Sure. So Rabbi, so Rabbi Salvechik's explanation was the reason why we do is so that we don't have a repeat of the temple being destroyed. We have to know what they did to us. So we learn from it. So that the second temple, so we remember it so the temple, second temple shouldn't be destroyed. 
it didn't work. But that's why we have to talk about it to try to help us prevent it from happening again. I Means say now that we have, so some people say like now that we have the state of Israel, why do we need to talk about Tisha B'Av? We have the state of Israel. No, I'll tell you why. So that it doesn't happen again. That the, the state doesn't get destroyed. So there isn't another Holocaust. That's what we have to talk about what's happened in our history so that it doesn't happen again. Even though right now we might not be in that position. That was what he was saying. And he was saying this to me because he felt it was happening again. That's the point. That's the point. You got it? Hop? Yeah. So unfortunately, we all get it now. Unfortunately. Um, uh, Okay. According to Rebbe Lazar, ben Az uh, okay, so. An interesting thing is that the Rambam does not count this mitzvah, uh, that you have to remember the Exodus at night. He doesn't count it at all. And so there's a whole discussion about that. Now. You have to count it as nice and bigger, or just it counts remembering it, not just at night. He doesn't count that you have to mention it at day and night. He doesn't mention that. He doesn't write, he doesn't count it at all. He doesn't. Now, what's the reason why we don't make a bracha on the Exodus? We don't make a bracha on that Seder either. Why don't we make a bracha on the telling of the story? Some people say if there's no bracha, it's no, no big deal. Like that, somebody said to me, I'm not going to the eclipse, there's no bracha. So why is there no bracha at the beginning of the Seder? There's a Shachiyon. Shachiyon is on the holiday. If he said it's Shachiyon on the holiday, you don't say it at the Seder. No, there's no bracha when you eat the meal Shabbat. There's no mitzvah in the meal. The mitzvah is the Kiddush. But there, here's, there's a mitzvah. There's a mitzvah of telling the story. Why is there no bracha? So... Why don't we make the brachas the meiri asher kedishanu mitzvot of itzivanu ahazki or sitzias mitzrayim? So thank you, God, for commanding us to remember the Exodus, and also for that matter, every day we remember the Shema, we recite the Shema. That's a mitzvah. So why don't we recite the bracha to remember the Shema and remember the Exodus? So Shema, we have blessings before it and afterwards. And why don't we do it at the Seder? I don't know, it's an open question. So the question is, in if during how do we rule? During the time of the Messiah, will we still be gathering for the Passover Seder? We'll still be a mitzvah to gather and talk about the Exodus. You can always throw out that question out there because you get a good vision of what a people's messianic, messianic uh, world look like. The Mashiach is the utopia. So what will it look about? So the Gemara says, So the Gemara in Brachos 12b says that Ben Zoma says to the sages, will we mention Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim in the time of the Messiah? It says, and they won't say anymore. It says explicitly in the prophets, it says explicitly in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 7, behold, the days are coming, says the prophet. Where God says they will no longer say God lives who led the children of Israel out of Egypt, but God, but rather they will say God lives, Asher Halav, Asher Aviyat, Zerabet Yisrael, Meir Tzafona. God lives who brought all of Israel from the north and from all the land that they were pushed out to. So Jeremiah says explicitly, they're going to stop talking about the Exodus and start talking about the latest redemption. So maybe they're going to stop talking about the Exodus now and start talking about the redemption of the Jews from Yemen, the Jews from Ethiopia, the Jews from 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 Syria, you know, a lot of a lot of Jews were rescued. So the um, the Rashba writes that there are some who learn from this that since you don't mention the Exodus in time of the Mashiach, if that's the case, then all the commandments about the Exodus will no longer be applicable in the time of the Mashiach. But Rashba says that's not the case. Uh, that he says. Okay, maybe we won't be obligated to mention the Exodus story, but we'll still have to eat them. The Korban Pesach and the Matzah, and and we still won't be able to eat Chametz on Pesach. Hold because on we don't second. learn any laws from the prophets. But it's in the Gemara. Ben Zoma asked this question in the Gemara. Yes, all I'm trying to say is that that 
we won't we do learn have to mention. It's not, it's not true that we don't learn halachas from the prophets. We do learn halachas from the prophets, just when they, we don't always learn halachas from the prophets, but we certainly do. Yeah, no, it's a, so. Okay. So anyway, that's a that's a good discussion. Oh, that discussion is Brachos 12b. So the rabbis responded to Ben Zoma that the verse doesn't mean that we're going to not talk about the Exodus, but rather it's talking about that it's not going to be the main the main point of the discussion. If that's all it's saying, it's not going to mean the main point of the discussion. Uh, so that's the whole question. Okay. Anyway, now we go up to the next phrase. Let's go on to the next part of the Haggadah. Baruch HaMakom, blessed be the space, blessed be he. Baruch Shanasan Torah, Amo Yisrael. Blessed be the one who gave to the Torah to the Jewish people. Blessed be he. Blessed be he. This is, what, a, what is this passage even doing here? Gesundheit. What is this passage even doing here? We just talked about the obligation of the Manashtana. We answered it with Avadim Ayinu. We then talked about the obligation to tell the story that there, even if you're smart and that the rabbis were saying it and then you have to say it all your life, even in the time of the Mashiach. And now we say, Baruch HaMakom Baruch Hu. What is that even doing? Phrases, it's like from out of left field. So what's that phrase about? So what does this mean? So from this point on, the, the uh, author of the Haggadah is going to start talk about this is an introduction to the four types of children that appear in the Torah about the Exodus, and they correspond to four verses. And so therefore, this is the introduction. We're praising God. And first we bless God that he gave us the whole Torah, that after we were redeemed from Egypt, we came close to Mount Sinai, and we're praising God for everything. And then we're going to go into the questions. Uh, the, some say that because we're now about to discuss to, discuss verses from the Torah. Each of the each of the children is going to cite a verse. Therefore, every time before we recite it, we study Torah, we have to say a bracha on the Torah. So we're making what's called a birkasa Torah. Because people, not everybody there has studied Torah. What did you got? What do you got there? You're sharing with everyone? Just the uh, end of a slurpy. End of a slurpy. Okay. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. So some say the Rokeh says that this is an introduction. I read yeah. that you can actually divide the Haggadah I can't, into four different parts where the structure is question, and, question answer, praise. Okay. Question, answer, praise. Question, answer, praise. Question, answer, praise. And so we've asked the questions. We've given an answer. And then we praise Hashem. And now we're going to ask the question again. From the four sons. The four sons. Okay. And then we're going to give an answer. And then there's going to be praise. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. Okay, now this is a great question, which every, which unfortunately a lot of people think about when they're in their darkest moments. Why is God called Makom? Why is God called place? And why does this appear in that? Called Baruch HaMakom Baruch Hu. Why is God called the place? We know that when a, a Rahman al-Islan, somebody said Shiva, we say, Amakom Yinachem Eslam. May the place comfort you. So why is God called a place? So I have here to this question seven answers. We'll go slowly. The Midrash, it says in the Midrash, and when it says in Archus Vayetze, Vayifka Bamakom, and when it says that Jacob departed, Vayetze Yakumi Bereshev, Vayelach Harana, Vayifka Bamakom, he encountered the place, and that's a reference to praying with God. But the Midrash says in Bereshit Rabbah, why does God called Makom? Why is God's name place? Because he is the place of the world, and the world is not his place. Wrap your head around that one. That's going to spin your head. Can you follow that, Moshe? He is the place of the world, and the world is not his place. I mean to say the world is in God's place, but God is not in the world. God is beyond place. So he's called the place. Because he's beyond place, he's called the place. He's infinite, so there's no place. 
So he's called the place. Because the world is in his place. <laughs> It'll sound better after two drinks of wine. <laughs> the Midrash Tehillim says, why is he called Makom? Because wherever Tzadikim, the Kol Makom she Tzadikim Omdim, wherever Tzadikim are standing, there God is found with them. In every place where I mention my name, I will go to you and bless you. So wherever we're, so right now God is with us in this place at the Seder. We're talking about God. God is there. Kishmak. Another answer is from the Ritva. He says, why does he use Makom? Because before the Torah was given to the Jewish people, they didn't know God's name. And so therefore, they, uh, he was hidden in a secret place. And so therefore, they referred to him as the place. And then once he gave the Torah, then his light became known to the world. Another thing is that Makom counts as the numerical value of as as a numerical value of of shame shall arba otiot. I don't know how to figure that one out, but okay. And it's basically saying that the, okay, I don't understand that one. I have to spend more time on it later. But is the, the Gematria of Makom is the same as UK Bobcat? No, no. The Gematria of Makom is 186. And it depends how you count. Shame shall arba otio. I don't understand. I don't know how it gets it. I have to spend more time on it. Okay. Um, I don't know. Okay. Um But maybe it's when you spell it out. That's what uh, some say that when you when you spell out the letter Yud ten times and the letter Hey five times and the letter Vav six times and the letter Hey five times, you're going to get 186, like uh, the number of Makom. Okay, we need some mathematicians. But the Israel Yo explains that since it mentions the giving of the Torah to the to the Jewish people, it needs to say that God's name is Makom. Because when you gave the Torah Mount Sinai, you perhaps think that God is confined to Sinai. So we need to say God is beyond place. He's the place of the world. Another explanation is that the exodus from Egypt, the that the exile to Egypt was to clarify the sparks of holiness that became to purify the sparks of holiness that became defiled in Egypt. When God broke the world, when the world broke, it, it, it broke because of a breaking of the Shrina. And the sparks went down into Egypt and they need to be purified. And so therefore, and so therefore it says Baruch HaMakom, meaning say Makom to tell us that the place caused them to be blessed with the sparks of holiness, because the sparks of holiness went into Egypt. Whatever, that's Kabbalistic. Rabbi Chasko Levenstein says that what's the reason why we say God is Makom? That it's because we need to emphasize in our mind the greatness of God who fills the whole world. But only afterwards, only afterwards, do, after we recognize the greatness of God who fills the whole world, can we recognize the greatness of kindness that the Torah speaks to every single type of person, the four children, meaning to say, even though God is the controller of the whole world, God comes down and speaks to each of us. That's the that's the power. Of course, there are many other answers you could also give, like basically the place, you sit at the Seder table, imagine the place, who's not there at that place? Blessed to be the place, maybe it could be a reference, not, not to God, but the place of people were missing at the Seder. The plus the place of the people who are not at the Seder this year. Baruch HaMakom, their people who are absent, people who are in captivity, people who are in deep mourning this year and they can't come to the Seder because their loved ones were killed and it doesn't feel right to be at a Seder without them. 
Maybe it's also a reference to Baruch HaMakom, blessed be the place of those who are missing. So that's another idea. Okay, very sad. We have to end on a happy note. Let's do one more explanation. That, why do we say Baruch Hu? Because every time we mention a tzaddik, zechot tzaddik lebracha. So whenever we mention God's name, we have to say Baruch Hu, whenever we mention it. So therefore, Baruch HaMakom, right away we say Baruch Hu. And now we say four times says Baruch, and this corresponds, and this is a, probably the most technical reason why we put this here. This is like a poem to introduce the four sons, because each of the four sons is being blessed. Baruch HaMakom, Baruch Hu, Baruch Shemas and Torah, Amo Yisrael, Baruch Hu. So we say the, the word Baruch appears four times, to teach us that all of the four children are blessed. That's to teach us all the four children are blessed. Even if your child is being a pain in the neck that day, all the children are blessed. But nobody's child, nobody's, nobody ever has a child who will be a pain in the neck. But I'm just saying, if some one child somewhere in the world exists, we say, Baruch Hu, he is blessed. I will stop the recording here.